Live from Washington, this is a news special, new terror threat. Terror in France. Thanks for joining us with this special report from Washington, the new terror threat. I'm Leon Harris. After an hours long standoff with police, the two suspects accused of killing a dozen people in this week's newspaper attack have been killed and hostages have been freed. Aaron McLaughlin is live in Paris. This is all unfolding. Reporters that the nation is relieved tonight. Three terrorists killed today in two separate hostage situations, and we are now learning new details that hostages died today as well. Now, the main terror suspects in the Charlie Hebdo terrorist attack were killed in a siege that took place in a printing business in a town not far from the Charles de Gaulle airport, according to French media. The brothers Saeed and Sharif Kouachi stepped outside and opened fire on police. Uh, explosions and automatic gunfire could be heard, but we understand from a local mayor that a man, uh, the sole hostage in that situation, is safe and sound. Uh, meanwhile, almost simultaneously in an eastern part of Paris, uh, police killed a hostage taker in a kosher shop. Incredibly, his female accomplice, though, according to a police union spokesperson escaped. Ten hostages freed. Uh, however, French President Francois Hollande tonight announcing uh, that four people tragically, uh, four people died tragically in that situation. Unclear, though, at this time if that figure includes the hostage taker himself. His accomplice has been identified as 26 year old Hayat Boumadien, uh, now a woman on the run. Another manhunt unfolded. Folding in France tonight, reporting live from Paris. I'm Aaron McLaughlin. Back to you. Thank you for that, Aaron. Now we have team coverage of the terror attacks. Let's go now to our live desk where Rebecca Cooper is standing by with more. Rebecca? Well, Leon, two very important simultaneous searches going on right now for the Paris police. First, for the woman we just spoke of, Hayat Boumedian. She is believed to have been responsible for the killing of a French police officer on Thursday. And now she was involved in this second hostage taking crisis today that unfolded at a kosher supermarket in Paris. Both of these hostage taking situations. Leon were very deliberate. The Kuwachi brothers moved in on an industrial park, taking a hostage, and then Hayat Boumedian with another accomplice, Amali Koulibaly, moved in on the kosher market. And this seemed very deliberate. This is a well known Leon Jewish neighborhood. And this all unfolded just before sundown Friday night. That is the Sabbath. And there were many Jewish shoppers out and about in the marketplace. We don't yet know who the hostages were that were killed, Leon. But many people say there were women and children in the market when it happened. Some of the hostages escaped along with Hayat Boumedin, but some of the hostages were killed. Simultaneously, Leon, one other important search going on. Police were not expecting these attacks today. Now they have to try and quickly assess through their intelligence sources. Are there others out there planning additional hostage attacks in France or beyond who may be working in concert with these? U.S. officials have said that the Kouachi brothers, at least one of them, uh, Saeed, was said to train in Yemen with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So many different things that intelligence officials are trying to pin down along with the police right now, Leon, as this all unfolds. We'll keep you updated from the live desk here at ABC 7 News and News Channel 8. Leon, back to you. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, the two standoffs there have come to an end over in France. However, there are still so many moving pieces involved here today. Joining us to discuss it uh, this hour, uh, former Virginia Congressman Jim Moran, WTOP national security correspondent J.J. Green, former FBI Special Agent Brad Garrett, Museum Chief Operating Officer Gene Polachinsky is also going to be joining us. Also with us, Zainab Chowdhury with the Council on Islamic Relations and Fahim Yunus, President of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Men Association USA. Now, as we said, we'll be hearing again from Rebecca Cooper. She'll have live reports on what's happening in Paris. Our Mike Kinnean is also tracking today's developments on Facebook and Twitter, and we will update you throughout this hour. Now, as soon as news broke of the attack, the worldwide intelligence community scrambled to figure out who the suspected gunmen were. Quickly, one man was taken into custody, but two people identified as the Kouachi brothers remained on the loose. They now are dead. 
Joining us right now, former Congressman Jim Aran and w National, WTOP and national correspondent J.J. Green. And also with us, uh, my satellite, we have uh, f former FBI Special Agent Brad Garrett. Let's start with you. Uh, Brad, we've been watching your coverage today on ABC News. Uh, give us a sense from your perspective and your experience about what you can tell from the way the French operations were carried out today. Well, Leon, they appear to be fairly well coordinated, I think fairly well trained. They, you know, they train with other Western, including us, uh, both military uh, and law enforcement. Uh, the problem with both situations, both at the at the at the market and also uh, at the at the printing press company, is that you knew that you were going to this was going to be tactical. That you were going to ultimately have to kill these guys because that's how they want to die, and they're not coming out. So how do you do that without anyone else getting harmed? Start with the hostages, then obviously the tactical team. You don't want them to get hurt. But once you get to that point, and once you feel like you've got the intelligence, which I think they had, and maybe the situation at the printing company, printing press company, was going south, and they knew they had to get in there, so they made a tactical entry. Mm -hmm. But you know what struck me, Brad, as I watched all of that play out in, in, in a double screen on, on the television, was there's a possibility that the, the whoever was holding hostages in that market were probably either in, in communication with my cell phone or some other method with whoever was in that printing company, and they also had perhaps access to television coverage. Isn't that a big concern in, in, in situations like this? And do you think there was anything that the authorities they were able to, I guess, listen in on or glean from that? Well, I, I would guess the following. If they did what they should have done, which is jam all the cell phones around the market uh, and around the printing press company, and also shut off any ways to any way to watch television or communication with the outside world, because the last thing you would want is for uh, the barricade in the market to know about the tactical takedown at the printing press company. And so, as a result, you want to cut that off. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. Um, there is apparently some information out now, Leon. Brad, Brad, Brad if, I, if you don't mind, if I, if I can cut away for a quick second, we understand that President Obama is speaking right now okay. to this issue. Let's take a listen. The people of France to know that the United States stands with you today, stands with you tomorrow. Our thoughts and prayers uh, are with the families who've been uh, directly impacted. Uh, we agree with you. We fight alongside you to uphold our values the values that we share, uh, universal values uh, that bind us together as friends and as allies. And in the streets of Paris, the world's seen once again what terrorists stand for. They have nothing to offer but hatred and human suffering. And we stand for freedom and hope and the dignity of all human beings. And that's what the city of Paris represents to the world. And, and, and that spirit will endure forever long after the scourge of terrorism is banished from this world. So, uh, so that's, okay, that's President Obama on the road in Knoxville, Tennessee there, and we wanted to get his uh, thoughts there. We knew that he would express con his concern and uh, condolences as well, uh, and sim uh, our guests, uh, his, uh, also his sympathies with the French people as he watches what it plays out there while he is on the road. Uh, Brad, I want to get back to you. Uh, again, uh, with your thoughts about what we we're seeing happen there, but tactically speaking, uh, especially when you look at the coordination in the timing of the two, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, events that when they stormed the two different hostage situations. And what you have there, Leon, I believe, if we were doing it here, would be the tactical commanders at each location are talking. And the folks at, at the printing press are saying, company are saying, We've got a situation, we're going to have to go in, which is probably going to precipitate you going in for the fear of, for whatever way, the information gets back to the marketplace shooter because he's already stated he's going to kill the hostages if, the, if he hears about the other situation. So it, it sort of forced their hand. So my guess would be there was a situation at the printing press they felt like they couldn't wait any longer, that the hostage was going to be harmed or it was just going south. The brothers stopped talking, and they saw it sort of degrading in front of them. So it's like, it's, this is not going to get any better. We're going in. How about the reports that we've heard that perhaps one of the hostage takers, we believe it may have been uh, the woman in Paris there at that market, uh, Hayat Amaboudin, uh, who said that uh, perhaps they said that perhaps she sneaked out with the, uh, some of the hostages there. What do you read from that? 
Well, if that's the case, that means that they did a, a very poor job in sorting people out. When you take people out, and you and I have watched this at school shootings, when you bring the kids out, you separate them, you, you briefly search them, and you debrief them. And you, nothing happens before that is done. Now, if the French didn't do that and she slipped out with the hostages, that's just not being thorough. What does that tell you about their level of, co of coordination? What does that tell you about how big this, this cell that they may be working with is? Well, th th that still remains to be seen. I realize that one of the brothers apparently made a comment to a television station uh, in France uh, prior to the tactical takedown that you know they were trained by Yemen, they were directed by Yemen. The training part I can buy, I, it remains to be seen about how formal Yemen might have been involved in directing this attack. All right, let's come here to, back to the studio. JJ, you've been talking to people based who are over there. What have you been hearing about what they expected to happen? Well, this is uh, the new frame for uh, okay, terrorism so you, you today. This is the situation that uh, a lot of intelligence and security people have been predicting for a while. You have tens of thousands of Western passport holders that have been training in Iraq and Syria with, with ISIL, and you have a whole other group of Western passport holders that have been in uh, Yemen training with uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. We know that that organization is still committed to attacking the West. In fact, uh, MI5's uh, head of operations said yesterday they've discovered that uh, AQAP and Al-Qaeda Corps is, uh, they are planning mass casualty attacks on the West. That's different from ISIL. ISIL is still looking at a regional kind of viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But AQAP still wants to attack the West, and this is something the French are very concerned about because the lion's share of those Western passport holders that are out of the country abroad fighting with the jihadist groups are from France. Yeah, and, and the ease with which they can travel because of that passport situation. Yeah. And also with European travel, it's so much easier to go from country to country. You can cross the borders there so easily. Easily. Very it's got to be very concerning. Um, how about the Congressman? Your thoughts about this? Uh, you, when you watch all of this and, and you hear these 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 threats, there are these promises even uh, from these figures who are saying that they, they they intend to to attack. All right, and we understand this. There's this sort of a competition of sorts going on between ISIS and Al Qaeda right now. Your your concerns? Well, the initial reaction is one of horror at the tragedy itself, but then. I think we have to recognize that this is not a one-off uh, situation, uh, one of a kind. These things are going to continue to occur. And we're not going to be able to kill, capture, or even convert all of the potential uh, terrorists there are around the world. Mm -hmm. And not just Muslims, or, uh, there are uh, other terrorists. We, we see the kind of extremism in, in uh, North Korea, for example, uh, when they hacked Sony. Um, I do think that uh, one of the most potent weapons we have is dealing with the moderate Islamic leadership in this country and around the world. I noticed that uh, Niyad Awad, who is the head of the Council on American Islamic Relations, was at the demonstration in front of the White House and he was interviewed. I don't know that they even recognized who he was, but, but he said, this is an offense against Islam. Muslims are not like this. This mm -hmm. is not a violent religion. And I'm here to, to say this is wrong and we condemn it. We need more of that. And I think, uh, you know, to some extent, the media needs to provide a platform for Islamic leadership, not people that look and talk like me, uh, yeah. uh, but, uh, but people who uh, know what they're talking about in terms of interpretation of the Quran to say this is wholly offensive to uh, anything that the, uh, the, that the Islamic religion uh, and teaches. You know, I, I, we will be talking about that quite a bit this hour, as a mm -hmm. matter of fact. This is not the first time we've had this conversation on mm -hmm. this set. Mm -hmm. But here's a question I would like to ask both of you, because we know that the Karachi, at least one of the Karachi brothers, I believe yep. Sharif, the younger mm -hmm. one, has been on the radar screens of security right. officials of both in France and here in America as well for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, is it fair to ask why he and his brother, that, that, that region, that cell, were not followed more closely? Here's the reason why. Gilles de Kerkhove, who is the uh, counterterrorism coordinator for the European Union, uh, I speak with him fairly often. And he told me not too long ago, the problem is there aren't enough people to keep track 
of all of the jihadist and violent extremists that are out there running around in the world, specifically in Europe. Mm -hmm. He said to me, it would take 25 people, essentially, to monitor one. So there's just not enough people to keep up with all of these individuals. And there are a lot of people, as you know, France has had a long history of this kind of activity. Uh, and um, when you look at the, the time we live in, it's a lot easier for uh, individuals and organizations to hide and to engage mm -hmm. because of technology and because of the connectivity of the world. So it's very difficult to keep up with all of these people in all fairness to the French and the French authorities. Yeah, he would not have been able to fly into the United States, for example. He was on a watch list. Uh, but as JJ says, there's limited resources and, and there are also legal rights that have to be respected. You, you can't constrain people's activities un until you can prove that there's a direct threat to uh, uh, to the safety of other people. Uh, so um, I, I don't know that they, the French could have done more than they could. I, obviously, 2020 is, uh, uh, or hindsight yeah. is 2020, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, that France is is going to be more on a security alert to the uh, similar to the way the United States is. We, I think, we recognize all over the world we're in this together. Nobody is immune. Nobody's safe, uh, and we have to collaborate, coordinate uh, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this is one more wake-up call. But here's one thing that's also true about this, and most mm -hmm. likely we will we'll see this happening more often. Authorities now recognize that these organizations are very skilled and know almost as much information as police and intelligence authorities know about buildings, people, places, and movements. Uh -huh. They're very good at pre-operational planning. But you know, in this case, um, that's a question that popped in, in, to my, in my mind, at least, was how much, of op how much operational planning in advance was there actually done here? And Brad, you may have some thoughts on this as well. Because what we've seen here in the last few hours or so is we've seen an attack on the magazine headquarters, which evolved into a manhunt across the countryside, which then evolved into a, a hostage taking and a standoff in two different parts of, of town, with one coming along seemingly um, almost on connected and we find out later there is a connection. There doesn't seem to be any sort of pre-planned method of escape. Uh, there seem to be questions about whether or not they planned on dying, whether they wanted to escape and get out of the country or whatever. There just seemed to be not that much of a, at first it, it appeared that, you know, the first video that we saw of them actually executing the, 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 the shootings at the headquarters, uh, at the newspaper rather, but they were thinking that perhaps these men were very well trained. And then when you see the way the whole thing evolved, it brings to mind, you have to question whether or not it was really well planned out, if it just sort of organically happened. And what does that say then about the level of planning, the level of sophistication, and whether or not they've got any significant level of support in some sort of a cell or whatever? Well, I think it's relative. Considering what took place over the long term, over these two days, the fact that they did escape, the fact that they actually were very calm about uh, what they did when they went into the building, mm -hmm. they, they knew names. They knew places, they knew how to get to where they needed to get to and to get out of the building. French authorities have told us very clearly that uh, there was some special police protection for some of those folks in the Charlie Hebdo magazine headquarters. But then when they got out and to make it uh, out safely away from police, uh, there was some level of training and the weapons that they were using, we kind of look at AK-47s as relics of the past, but they're still not that easy to handle. And then to plot and plan a, a robbery of a gas station to get away, uh, there was some planning there. And the bottom line on it is, um, it may not have been perfect, but it was relative. It was enough for them to get to where they needed to, mm -hmm. I think. I suspect that we will find there were other people involved, the people who armed them, the people who trained them, uh, the people that they conversed with. Mm. It was a, a, a quick reaction to that cartoon, uh, but they obviously were prepared for some kind of uh, a violent terrorist attack. So there has to be a cell there, and and uh, and, and just killing these folks, even if we arrest or catch the woman or kill her, they, uh, there's got to be a larger yeah. network. So uh, uh, I, I think the intelligence networks uh, in France uh, and the United States are after them. Well, let's ask Brad Garrett yeah, about that. Brad, what do you think is happening right now in terms of what they've learned from what they've gone through today, mm. what they've heard when they've actually
actually, if they have done any surveillance or any, any sort of investigating of any communications that have taken place, what are they likely doing there on the ground there in terms of finding out how big this cell is and what else may be planned? And do they expect something else to happen and soon? Uh, my guess is they suspect something to happen and hopefully they may even know about uh, portions of it at this point, Leon. The advantages obviously they have now is early ID of the two brothers. Uh, and we're able to, to backtrack from a historic standpoint based on what we have in the U.S., which they already have in their own system. And then they can go back and look at, at, at data, look at cell phone records, look at email, talk to informants. And through all, all of that, they may be able then to pull together uh, that this is perhaps bigger than the, than the, than the two brothers and perhaps the guy on the market uh, you know, who had some affiliation with them. Uh, it still remains to be seen, as far as I'm concerned, you know, how formal all of this is. You know, he espoused, one of the brothers espoused, as I said earlier, that, you know, that they were directed by Yemen to do this. Mm. That may or may not be the case. I mean, you know, he's about to die, so he's probably going to say anything that makes him look bigger. But uh, it, it, when you start to look at these groups of people, I mean, are the two brothers really much bigger than the Zarnayev brothers in Boston? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I'm glad you brought them up, Brad, because one of the, of the things I wanted you all to, to give me your insights on, or is this 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 uh, this idea of using, I guess, family connections to recruit? We saw that happen with the the case of the Boston Marathon bombing. We're seeing it happen here. What do you what do you read from that? What do I read from? I'm not sure. I'm sh the, the idea that these, the, whoever is bec the radicalization yeah. uh, of these Islamists uh, seems that, at least in these two cases we've seen, where, where family connections were used, where two brothers were the ones who, in both cases, were the ones who sort of created their own little cell and, and, and executed their, their, their plots here. Is there something to be read in that? Well, I think to a certain extent, I mean, if you look at the cultural aspect of it, the younger brother is going to follow the older brother. Uh, I think that clearly was the case with the uh, Jahar and Tamerlan mm -hmm. uh, in Boston. Is it true between Saeed and Shara? I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have to have to see. There's, that's that's a component of it. But in each example, Leon, you have at least one brother that either did go overseas and get trained, which one of them is claiming he did, and then you have another that at least attempted in, in, in the Zanayoff brother's situation who went over. It remains to be seen whether he got trained at all yeah. other than just hanging out. But the point being, they are trying to identify with bigger groups. And is it aspirational? Is it real? Is it a combination thereof? You know, did he get sent, did the, did the one brother in, in France Go to training, get sent back. Say, just hang out. You know, we'll we'll tell you to do something at some point. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I, it, it sounds too organized. They, they don't tend to be that organized today. But we'll have to see. Okay. But to go back to your quickly, to go back to your one question that's the most important: What are other are there other elements to them? And I think there probably are. The question is, how big is that? That is the big question. That is the big question, Congressman. What are you reading from what we've seen today? Uh, again, going back to the comment you made earlier about 20, hindsight being 2020, mm -hmm. the coordination and cooperation between allies on intel, in, in this case, do you think there was enough? Do you think there should have been more? Oh, I, I suspect there was enough. Uh, we, train, we trade uh, watch lists and so on. Uh, we exchange information. Uh, but uh, and, and one of our most valuable sources of intelligence is normally what they call human, human intelligence. Uh, but of course, if you're working with family members, it's very difficult to get somebody infiltrated uh, to get that kind of uh, information reported back. Hard That's to get closer than a brother. Well, yeah, you know? uh, they're loyal. Uh, and and uh, that kind of blood loyalty, uh, I'm sure, is, is considered uh, an, an asset for any a small cell, but but um, I don't think it's a lack of of, uh, of coordination. Uh, we do trade technology. Um, uh, uh, France is a, a strong ally uh, uh, within the international intelligence network, mm -hmm. but I suspect there's going to be all the more effort to, to trade more information to you know to exchange insights on how this might have been gathered and over time things evolve we do gain information from every terrorist attack and we're somewhat better prepared for the next one as, as a result. politician as a, as a government leader what do you make of the way that the french government 
kept their, their, their populace informed throughout this process and, and the way they conducted themselves? Any lessons to be learned for us there? I think it's exactly what we should be doing. I, I, I think sometimes we miss the boat, uh, we miss opportunities when uh, the law enforcement and intelligence communities feel they have to keep everything to themselves. Uh, oftentimes people in the community are our best eyes and ears to tell us what's going on. Uh, and uh, you know, if you see something, report it. And uh, you can't do that unless uh, you have sufficient information to know uh, what the, the terror threat might be at any given point in time and place. All right.